Welcome to our Champion School of Real Estate monthly superstar series. And uh, I am so, so very excited today to have two of our wonderful champion graduates. We are focusing on Fort Worth and we are also focusing on Plano. And uh, we have two great people that will be telling us about their niche in real estate. So uh, first of all, I want to say hello to everyone around the state, most definitely our Plano campus, and then our Fort Worth campus, Austin, San Antonio, Houston Galleria, Houston West, Houston North at our brand new campus on the 99 Grand Parkway, and then as well, all of our virtual people. So hello, hello, hello from your founder and owner of Champion School of Real Estate, Rita Santa Maria. And it is always my pleasure to be able to bring to you these wonderful Champions graduates, just like you who sat in a class eight years ago and about 18 years ago, and are the successes that they are today. So let me first introduce Mr. Denton Aguam. And Denton is with the Keller Williams office, Plano. Good morning, Denton, how are you? Good morning, I'm great. Thank you for having me. You are so welcome. And thank you for being part of our champions graduates, we like to call you our alumni, and uh, good to have you. And then we have Barrett Raven. Barrett is with Austin Realty, Realty Austin, and got it backwards for just a minute. And good morning, Barrett. How are you? Hey, good morning. I'm doing awesome. It is an incredible honor to be able to sit here with you guys today. I'm pumped. Well, we love having both of you and each of you have your own niche, your own story to tell. And I'm gonna start out by just saying, I love your background, uh, Barrett, because it's so Austin, everybody rides a bicycle. <laughs> yes, welcome to the other here. <laughs> do you ride that bike to work or do you ride it out around for fun? What's the story on the bike? Yeah, all of the above. I ride it to work. Sometimes I used to be known as the cycling realtor. My clients would expect me to show up, you know, super red faced and sweating and they'd be disappointed when I wasn't coming rolling up on my bike. It was funny. But no, and I also I race with a racing team here in town. I, um, I ride actually here. I do indoor training in my office some mornings and I just ride for fun and for competition. Well, that is really interesting to find out. And yes, everyone would expect you would show up for an appointment sweating and hot in our Texas weather. <laughs> but um, that is definitely a great way to keep fit. And um, most definitely, we all admire the fact that you do that. So good story. Now, Barrett, you have uh, three children. Is that right? That's right. And how old are those children? So I've got a 10 year old boy, an eight year old boy and a five year old girl. Wow. So she's spoiled rotten, I'm sure. Oh my gosh. Yes. She, it's so cliche, but she has me wrapped around her little finger. 100%. <laughs> I can only imagine. And then uh, Den Denton, you have, I believe, two children, a four year old and one year old. Is that right? That's correct. Nash and, uh, are you riding your bike to work? Are you riding your bike around town? <laughs> I have not. You would get killed 
Yeah, you would get killed in Plano if you did that. Sorry yeah. to interrupt. What do you like to do, hobby, fun, personalize who you are? Yeah, so my wife and I, Brandy, are both really into sports. Uh, Baylor Bear alumni, go Bears. And uh, we also enjoy playing golf as well. Um, really being outdoors. My wife loves to travel, so we get to go to great places like Colorado, Hawaii, and she, she definitely books us and keeps us busy. We're headed to uh, Disney World uh, here in about a month with the kids. Nice. Isn't that exciting? Now that we have so many of our people vaccinated, we definitely can see there's more travel going on. Right. Everybody getting out and about a little bit more. Disney World will be great for the kids. And um, this month, the theme um, was basically finding your niche and how to do that. And yeah, I want to start off with just a very simplistic question. Was there a defining moment when each of you decided to literally come to Champion School of Real Estate either online or in the classroom, whichever, and decide to be a real estate professional. Um, Denton, what about you? Can you remember the moment you decided to do that and maybe tell us why you decided? Yeah, I can. Um, I will tell my story short because it can be long. I was graduated from Baylor, went straight into uh, this career. However, it wasn't because it was by design. Uh, at the time, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do with my life. A close friend, fraternity brother of mine's father was a big real estate agent uh, and said, go get your license, look at real estate. If you like it, great. If not, come to Austin and, and work with me. And he was a big commercial realtor in Austin. All right. Oh. Yeah. Long story short, I got into uh, residential real estate, joined Keller Williams Plano. The first six months of my career, just to be open, I did not sell a house. So I'm a late bloomer. <laughs> I got some great direction from my team leader at the time, George Alpazar, and uh, sold maybe about 12 or 13 houses uh, the next six months. And the rest has kind of been history and, and slowly built the team to where we are today. Wow, that is a great story. And from what I understand, talking with you early, your family is really in the medical field. So yes. I'm sure that was a big surprise for them that you didn't become a doctor, but instead a very successful real estate agent. Yeah. Sorry, mom, dad. Still, still a little sore, but yeah. <laughs> well, obviously it worked out really well 18 years later. And I do have to add, when you mentioned Baylor, we have two family members that graduated from Baylor. So we were pretty happy that the end of that basketball game went our directions. So congratulations to all those Baylor Bears. Yeah, congrats to them. And Barrett, what about you? What was your defining moment? God, you know, kind of like didn't, I'm going to try to keep this as short as possible, but essentially, so I was a teacher before I got into real estate. So I was a teacher here in Austin, middle school and high school math teacher for eight years. And uh, my, our middle son, who's eight now, his name's Wyatt. When he was a week old, he had just major heart failure and he's okay. Now he's a little Tasmanian devil. He's crazy. He's doing great. Um, but he had major heart failure and then he had open heart surgery when he was two weeks old. And I just kind of out of desperation, I was just asking a guy at church, just like, what do I do? How do I pay for all this? Like, I, I don't know what to do. And he said, man, you need to look into being a home inspector. And so I just Googled real estate schools and I stumbled upon the champion side and started looking into getting licensed to be a home inspector. That took me about 15 seconds to realize this would be a horrible job for me. Um, and, you know, going under houses and looking for rodent poop and stuff and like going into attics and stuff. I was like, this would just be awful. But I saw the real estate salesperson licensing courses and started looking into it and just thought, oh my gosh, this is like, I'm a teacher, so I have patience. I studied economics at UT during the financial crisis in 2008. And I love markets and math and all that sort of stuff. And I thought this could be the perfect job for me. And so one thing led to another and did it hybrid, in-person, online, 
licensing courses and here we are today. I love it. You have a great little theme that you could put and maybe you do in all of your marketing, but I instantly thought teacher to top producer. And I also want to congratulate you on being in the platinum top 50 for 2018, 2019, and 2020. And uh, Amber Thomas is a great friend of Champion School of Real Estate. And we also sponsor the Platinum Top 50. So congratulations on those awards. You know, people sitting in class right now, which we have over 1,200 watching today, um, Facebook Live as well as Classroom and virtual as well, they're sitting there and they're trying to identify with each one of you. And they are identifying with each one of you. So, uh, Barrett, knowing that there are brand new people, could you give them a little bit of information on maybe what was the most fearful for you going into real estate, how you overcame those fears, or if you still have those fears, how you overcome those fears daily. Can you share a little bit about that being brand new? Absolutely. And I mean, a lot of this is going to be just very personal to me. Um, But I would say my biggest fear was not having a guaranteed paycheck, right? I mean, I straight out of college, I was a teacher and I had, you know, insurance. It was a state job, basically. And so I had insurance, I had a guaranteed salary. Um, And so I think that was the biggest, that was the biggest fear for me was not having a guaranteed paycheck. And I would say it, I mean, sometimes you have to stumble your way through that. And I found that if I do the right things, the business will take care of itself. Right. And so there's a saying actually, like it was either from Tom Landry or Vince Lombardi. I honestly can't remember, but he said, do the right things long enough and you will be rewarded and do the wrong things long enough and you will be exposed, right? And so Mm -hmm. I love that quote. And so I realized, I learned pretty quickly to keep my eye off of kind of the financial scoreboard, so to speak, and really focus on just waking up every day and doing the right things. And we can talk about what those right things are later if you want. Um, But I think that's really how I, I overcame it. And I just, I learned to have confidence in my ability to sell. Um, And so I think that, that really helped me overcome. Um, It's been a long time since I worried about a paycheck. Most definitely confidence helps everybody overcome uh, fear and confidence you gain by doing all the things that you obviously did, training, reading, really learning what you need to do on a daily basis and then, then doing it, being persistent about doing it. And uh, Denton, what about you? Starting out, can you share with us your feelings and how you overcame that concern about being your own boss? And basically, if there's any money to be paid, uh, it comes straight from your efforts. How did you deal with that as a new person? Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with Barrett. I mean, first is you're responsible for everything, both the liabilities and also the assets that you can gain in this business. I think specifically for me on my story, um, I was really concerned on just fulfilling my potential. And, you know, a lot of people you come out of college, go get a job, just get a paycheck, figure things out, and then you can go chase your dreams later. And for some reason for me, because going back to my story, I was studying to be a doctor. I kind of turned my world completely upside down as soon as I got out of college, right? And didn't know what I wanted to do. But I did know I had this entrepreneurial spirit inside me that drove me to do what I want to do. Uh, and I knew I needed to fuel that and find that. So real estate happened to be that, that passion. Uh, I think one thing that I would tell myself or that I remember going through that first six months, I was so confused and distracted and was doing so many things. I wasn't really focused on one thing or as Barrett would say, I wasn't focused on the right things. And then, of course, when I finally got some help, I focused on one thing, which was my database, which we can talk about later. And my business took off really quickly over that that next six months. Um, So for me, it was just really getting my focus together. 
right? I was kind of a, had my cut, a chicken with my head cut off running all directions when I was uh, first starting. But you're a brand new person and yeah. you're not really sure exactly how no. to get your act together. And most everyone feels that way. And as Barrett mentioned, we in our classroom tell our students, don't be surprised if you don't have a paycheck for a few months, because it would be unusual if you got paid right away. And it does take a bit of training and time to get your lead generation going and then basically have people remember that you're now not a teacher, you are in real estate as a real estate professional. So 18 years later, um, let's think, Denton, about how you started out with lead generation. What advice could you tell our brand new people on literally getting their career started? Will you share that with us? Absolutely. Um, number one, I think you have to keep lead generation at the forefront of your mind, that it's ultimately the only thing that matters, meaning whatever you choose your lead generation technique to be, and most people, it's going to be database, uh, open houses, maybe you're a cold caller in your former background, and you want to do that, whatever it is, choose that one and go in deep with it. Don't do what I did and try to be the jack of all trades. Go in with one, whether that be database, whether it be open house, whether that be cold calling. Now, most for most people, including myself, I ran into a company called Brian Buffini, and it really helped me to build a business by referral only. And that was the majority of my career. And as I've progressed, I realized, well, there's a lot more business out there than just referral only, right? But you've got to keep that at the forefront and, you know, don't get distracted. I know you want to by your websites, your business cards, your signs, your logo. That's all great and is important, just not urgent, if that makes sense. Some of you are thinking, wow, I'd really like to be able to take all those notes down I can't write that fast. I can't type that fast. That's okay. I just wanted to let everybody know that tomorrow this interview will be on YouTube. And uh, so if you didn't catch everything, you can catch it tomorrow on the Champions YouTube channel. Also, Carla is putting some comments, uh, those wonderful nuggets that you're mentioning. She's putting them down below in uh, the byline of our interview today so that people have a chance to see that. Uh, being a teacher, Barrett, would you be very specific with our new people and tell them what is lead generation, how do you go about it, and basically what is entailed with starting out as a new person? Yeah, no, that's great. I, I mean, lead generation, like very simply put, is having clients to work with. Right. I mean, in order to client to have business, you have to have clients to work with. And in order to have clients to work with, you have to get them from somewhere. So you have to generate a lead, um, someone who raises their hand and says, you know, Barrett didn't. I want to buy or sell my house with you. So that's a lead. Um, and so you have to have a system and a process of cultivating those leads and staying top of mind with with your people. Um, and so it's really interesting. So, I mean, kind of piggybacking on what some of Denton was talking about. Uh, for me, it was crazy. I actually, so I got my real estate license and what I did since I didn't have any experiences, I was just documenting my real estate journey on social media. So on Facebook and Instagram and just inviting people into that journey, right? So my first class at Champions, I took a picture of the the logo that's right behind you, Rita, you know, take a picture of the logo and post it. I'm getting my real estate license. And then when I pass or when I pass my last class, I just passed my last class. Oh my gosh. It's so cool. Like a goofy selfie with me. Like I got my license. Oh my gosh. It's so cool. And then when I picked a brokerage, I, I just documented all of this. Right. And so literally the day I got my license and I picked a brokerage the next day, the art teacher at the school where I was working, I did both jobs for a year and a half, by the way. Um, the art teacher was like, Barrett, I saw on Facebook, you got your real estate license. Well, I want to sell my investment property. So you want to sell it? And I was like, sure. Um, so long story short, we ended up selling her uh, rental property. Um, we got a cash offer closing in 10 days. So within a month of getting my real estate license, I had 
close my first deal. And so that was really great. And what the advice I was given by the coach um, at my first brokerage, he was just like, Barrett, your job is to demonstrate and basically prove to your social network that you are a working realtor, right? That you sold a house. Um, so again, demonstrate and prove to your social network that you are actually doing this as a job. So that's probably my best advice. You no, know, Barrett, we regularly ask our students to do just exactly what you said. You get that license, and when you go to our website, you'll see some of our students, well, actually on Facebook, they're jumping up in the air. They have their license, and I love what you said, sharing your journey. I'm now in real estate, and keeping up with your SOI, your spheres of influence, by letting them know what you're doing, mm -hmm. and part of that being to jumpstart your career, also open houses. And I heard Denton say earlier, he mentioned open houses. So how do you feel about open houses, Denton? Do you do them regularly? Do you invite new people to help you with that? Tell us about open houses today. Yeah, specifically the answer of short is yes, we do do them. Um, it is not our primary source of business. However, agents on my team, uh, they do commit to their database in one other form of lead generation. And most of them, it's open houses. Uh, so most of them are minimum doing two a month and we approach it pretty technical on Wednesday. They start calling around the neighborhood with a dialer, inviting people to the open house. Cause I think one of the mindsets that people tend to have is they think open houses are for buyers, which is great. You definitely can get buyers out of it, but it's actually if done correctly. You get listings out of it. Right. And that's what you can do in this business to get listings. On the day before or day of, they door knock the open house. They offer home valuations of people that want to know what their home is worth, which is very valuable today. Uh, and then they hold the open house for about two hours and then do follow up the next day and on Monday uh, after they do the open house. It's a super way to possibly sell a house. And in today's market, as both of you know, there's, there's so much activity from buyers, there aren't literally enough properties out there right. for all the buyers that we have. So open houses really will gain a lot of potential prospects for you. And for new people, it's a great way to get your feet wet. You were gonna add something to that, Denton. Well, that's one little tip and trick, especially for today's market that we do on the next open house we do in the neighborhood, we'll call again, but we'll say, hey, we just sold that house down the street at 123 Main Street. We had over 30 offers, but unfortunately only one of them was able to win. So we got 29 other people that want to be in this neighborhood. Do you know if you or somebody else wants to sell? We got over X percent over asking. Uh, and that's a lot of people interest. Absolutely incredible. You, you just hit it. If you only are able to sell one, you have 39 people that now need your help. That's right. So, yeah. Barrett, how do you feel about open houses in Austin? Tell us a little bit about your market, maybe your difficulties that you're having in the Austin market right now. Yeah, I mean, our market is really tough right now. Um, I mean, just like so many other cities in the country, I mean, inventory is so incredibly tight. I mean, if priced correctly, I mean, every house has 20, 30, 40 offers. You know, we had one the other day that had 97 offers, not my listing, unfortunately, um, but we offered on it. And so, I mean, the challenge is, is um, you know, to really, if we don't even call it buying a house anymore. We call it winning a house. Like literally that is what we call it with our clients. Um, and so we say it's possible to win a house in our market if you know what to expect and you're willing to do what it takes to play the game. Right. And so one of the biggest challenges is, I mean, you have to offer 70 to $80,000 over asking price on average right now. And appraisals are coming in about 20 to 30 K below contract price, not to get too technical with it on this webinar, but um, the challenge is, you know, your classic first time home buyer putting 5% down and it took them two years to save up for their down payment. They don't have the financial resources to play that game more often than not. And that's, that's a huge challenge. Um, Cause I was a teacher, like I want to help teachers buy houses. I want to help, I want to help people 
um, buy their first home. That's really hard. Um, now, as far as open houses go, it's funny. In my going on eight years career, I think I've done a grand total of four open houses. I think I'm really embarrassed to admit that. Um, but we're actually finally starting a, um, a geographic farm, uh, which we can go into more later if y'all want. And so I definitely plan on doing a lot more open houses in the very near future. But the few times I've done them on listings of ours, it's they've been great and I've generated leads from them. I just, it isn't one of my big pillars in my business. Well, let's talk about that right now. There is what you mentioned, a geographic farm. And um, most definitely you become the specialist in that area. And I want us to bring that forward with certainly our students that are sitting in class the importance of a farm. How do you choose a farm? What even does that mean, a farm? So I'm going to move that back to you, Barrett, and talk a little bit about why you decided now to do a geographic farm or to pick up a new farm. Yeah, okay. I like telling stories. So I'm going to tell you a quick story that helped me decide to pick a geographic farm. So about three months ago, I went to a listing appointment. These are past clients of mine. We helped them buy their house about five years ago. It's time to sell. And I sit down at their kitchen table, like locked in. I have the listing, no problem, right? These people love me and my team. And my client, she, the wife, she sits down at the table and she says, Barrett, before we get started, I have to show you something. And she pulls out this fat stack of this just, you know, letter sized paper, these, these kind of pale yellow flyers. And she had been saving these flyers that an agent had been sending her for years and years and years. And honestly, it, the flyers aesthetically, they looked like they were made in like a Baptist church in the early nineties, like nothing special whatsoever. Right. Um, but it had everything that was in her neighborhood, you know, everything for sale, everything pending and everything that had sold in the previous month. And my client had marked these flyers up, you know, with how they compared to her house and everything. And she said, I want to know that you are going to be able to get for us. I want to know that you're going to be able to sell our house for what this agent sold all of these houses for. And I go, wait, 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 you think that agent sold all of those houses? And she said, well, yeah. And I said, no, 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 no. that is not how this works that agent is just pulling MLS data and she's giving you the information. Right. And she, her mind was blown. She was like, Oh my gosh, I thought like this name, this agent had this neighborhood on lockdown. Right. Like she sold every house in our neighborhood. Like if we didn't have such a great relationship with you, we would have definitely worked with her. And I was like, Oh my gosh, it made me realize how easy it is to convince people that you are the expert in their neighborhood. And that if they need to sell, they go to you first. And so that was really eye-opening to me. Um, and so really, we picked a geographic farm in Austin where, number one, there's been a lot of sales there recently. But secondly, there's not a lot of active inventory. Third, it's a price point that's like really healthy for us. Like we want to raise our price points a little bit. So it's a little bit higher than our average price point. And then I'd say fourth, there is not one agent who has this particular neighborhood. They do not dominate this neighborhood. So in the last 90 days, there was not one agent who sold more than one house in that neighborhood. So the opportunity is there. Uh, we can become the neighborhood expert. And so we're, we're doing do it. I love your explanation because it also explains that as agents, when we sit down at that kitchen table with sellers or the conference table with buyers, we need to educate them. Many think when they see a sign in a yard that you've already been paid, that you got money and therefore you got to put your sign in the yard. So explaining how we get paid is certainly one part of education. And your description of the agent listing all of the properties in that neighborhood and giving the feeling that they own the neighborhood. Um, that is, again, another opportunity for education. 
So very good example. Farms are really important to become a specialist in those areas for sure. So Denton, over to you on the farm area and being a specialist. How did you start out? Did you start out with a farm? Did you start out specializing in a certain price range? How did you formulate what we would call your niche in the marketplace? So, um, no, no, ma'am, did not do a farm. Um, my niche, um, simply put, is I niched my database. I built a moat around my database. Uh, what that means is we've got now just over maybe 2,000 past clients. And then we probably have in the database, well, we have up to 50,000 in the database, but not all those people we're in contact with. And we we're building what you'd call a moat around those 2,000 people plus the other people that we've been in contact with. And we do that through um, a program where we basically are in front of them over 100 times in one year. That's through mailings, through text, through giveaways, through client appreciation parties, uh, both online and offline. Uh, our big ones are probably our face-to-face -face client appreciation parties, which we had to pivot all of last year because of the pandemic. Um, but one of the best ones we do, uh, we rented out a... Uh, the Frisco Rough Rider Stadium, which is probably similar to the one in Round Rock, did a movie night and had over a thousand people RSVP to bring their families, come in, trick or treat. We did it over Halloween and played a nice uh, Halloween movie for the kids. And we just constantly stay in front, but we're very purposeful too about asking for the business. I think that's one of the big tips I would give everybody is don't forget to ask for the business. Um, so we ask people there home evaluations, do they know somebody wanting to buy or sell real estate, as well as are they thinking about getting into real estate? So I'm a new person and yeah. I am listening to you and I'm thinking, wow, those are great ideas. Yeah. I need to really wrap myself around my center of influence, everybody that knows me that I've worked so hard to put a network together, stay in constant touch with them, what do you feel is a good uh, particular schedule to stay in touch with people that you are putting a moat around? I love that. In order to say you are my clients and I'm going to service you so well, you won't even think about using someone else. How often do you stay in touch with them? So I would gather your database of at least a minimum of 100 people. Uh, and there's a script you would ask to see if they have a real estate need, do they have a realtor that they refer to? I would stay in touch with them at least once a quarter by phone, once a month by email, and then at least do one type of event face-to-face -face with them when you're first starting out, right? You can probably do that on a pretty low budget. You don't have to do anything big or fancy. That's what I did. And then the other touch you can do, in addition to all that, which is big, and it was a big Brian Buffini, is after every conversation, Rita, write a thank you card or a note card to that person, thanking them for their time. Absolutely. The personal touch is the best touch. And yet, in this day and time, we need social media like we've never even imagined before. And we need to do everything from the print media to the personal touch to social media. And uh, Barrett, when you're staying in touch with your people, how often do you do that? And can you give our students some insight into what you do to keep in touch with your centers of influence? No doubt. And we could do a whole class on this, let me tell you. Um, so I love Denton's model and maybe after i've been in the business for 10 more years i will go for something like that um for me like we i kind of think of it as like i try to reach a lot smaller group of people so my perfect business model would be 100 people sending us four transactions a year right um so that would be 400 transactions an amazing business right there we'd be the top real estate team in austin if we could do that um and so that's what we're working towards right now. And so I have uh, two lists of people. And so the first list is my top 50 favorite past clients. So just 50, right? So 
um, that's people who we had a transaction with who like, I want to spend more time with them. I know they want to spend more time with me and they're raving fans, right? Um, then we have our top 50 VIPs. And these are people who have not necessarily done a transaction with us before, but maybe they're a financial planner, an insurance agent, a CPA, lender, inspector, people like that. Um, and so what we do is we have a system of just loving on those 100 people. And so I call each of them once a month, just on the phone. So I call 12 past clients a week, 12 VIPs a week. So that, you know, that ends up calling all of them once a month. Um, and then I generally see all of them once a month. So my schedule is pretty packed with, you know, 30 minute coffees, a lunch here and there, just had breakfast with a VIP right before this interview. Um, and yeah, we just have these monthly kind of scheduled uh, meetups where I just get to connect with them face to face. Um, and then I do monthly happy hours with them where I just treat them to hors d'oeuvres and drinks. We've had to switch it up because of COVID, but we'll get back to in-person here in the next couple months. Um, and then I send out an email. I do a YouTube video every week where I email those 100 people and everybody else um, in the database. We have about a 250 person database. So again, we keep it a little tighter. Um, and then I stay in front of them on social media. Uh, we send birthday gifts, birthday cards. I call them on their birthday. We do annual reviews for their real estate holdings um, where we give them like a yearly valuation of their, their real estate, their property. Ooh, good idea. Mm -hmm. um, followed up with a call, sometimes face-to-face -face meeting to go over it. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're, my days are pretty stacked with, with pretty daily communication, honestly, with a lot of Let me just there. say, I am so impressed that you do so much personal attention. And I love the fact that you brought that forward because if I'm a new person, I'm thinking I have very little money right now to spend on advertising, but I have a whole lot more time that I can spend. And we know historically in all of our marketing classes and Brian Buffini that personal is outstanding. And then, of course, Denton mentioned that he certainly makes sure that they ask for the business. And that sometimes uh, means you have to really have a lot of self-confidence to ask for it. But the idea of getting together for coffee with a past client is great. But the very idea of taking the time to call them and see them personally is, is huge and doesn't cost much to do that. So for all of our students watching, most definitely when you are, and I'm going to reach over here for my book, actually, 30 Days to Success, it starts out with the mathematics that uh, Barrett was talking about who do you, how many contacts do you need in order to get a prospect, how many prospects to get a listing or a buyer, and then in it from day one to day 30, things you can do that don't cost you money. But very, very much the personal approach is huge. And then listening to Denton that I love Frisco. I love that stadium. I've been there a couple of times with my grandson. And to have a movie night, well, you know, you could do a movie night in your backyard with a projector and yeah. the side wall of your house. And in Austin, that would be very common and expected. And so many things that just say, hey, I remember you, please remember me. And your two examples, uh, not two examples, but the examples that the two of you gave were just outstanding to help everyone have an idea. So Denton, let's say I am a licensed agent and I'm sort of a middle of the road producer and I want to move my production up higher. What suggestions do you feel like a middle of the road person might use in order to be more, more successful? Great question. And I do think it might be slightly specific to the person, but I'll, I'll kind of give you the overview. I think you kind of, one, need to get a, a coach or a mentor 
to kind of help you see your blind spots. Mm -hmm. All right. And what I mean by that is what got you to where you are today is normally not going to get you where you want to go tomorrow. Right. Doesn't mean you give up what you're doing. It's just, you may have to understand where your strengths and weaknesses are for most people. Keep it simple. Um, they just aren't looking at another lead generation tactic to add to their business, or they're not going deep enough in the lead generation tactic that they have um, applied themselves to. So if they're doing database, they're not going deep enough in their database. Maybe they need to call them a little bit more often or just do a small little happy hour, right? If they're doing open houses, maybe they need to do increase their open houses instead of doing two a month, maybe four months. Those little micro changes, what I call in my business, usually have big, big results on the back end. And then just understand any change you make, measure it for 90 days. And if it's making change, keep doing it. And if it's not making changes, then keep adjusting like all great people do. That's good. Our students are getting such valuable information. And I know Barrett has a few things he wants to add to that. So what are your thoughts on bringing my level of production up a little higher? Yeah, I mean, this is going to be a little heady for the brand new people, but for people who are kind of middle of the road and want to break out, yeah, I would say I completely echo what Denton is saying. I've had a coach for the last three and a half years, um, and it's just been an absolute game changer for me. And I would say getting the team right, right? Like learning to delegate. Um, and I think so often we as realtors, because we start out as sole, you know, entrepreneurs, like sole practitioners, it's hard for us um, to really elevate our teams because we want to be seen as the baller, right? Like we want to be seen as the, the awesome like realtor. And I think it's really hard sometimes for people to really elevate your team or your group. Um, and so for me, it was getting the right people in the right seats, having extreme clarity with roles and responsibilities with my team and learning how to delegate really well that i think that really kind of helped us has helped us break out in the last couple of years because you can only scale you being an amazing baller so much right that's right well most definitely bringing in a coach is such a very fine point to make and you've mentioned brian buffini Longtime coach, his company is outstanding. Most uh, of our agents will find coaches within their company. I know Keller Williams has a great program uh, for finding a coach, as does many other companies. But uh, finding a coach, finding a mentor, and then being accountable for what they ask you to do and for what they basically encourage you to do. I know that some are wondering, well, how many hours a week do these superstars work? And um, let me start over here with Denton of Guam. How many hours do you work? Uh, do you take off? Well, we know you take off for vacation. You're going to be leaving soon. Tell us about your work plan every week. So I'm really um, believe in time blocking. I didn't earlier in my career. So for me, the mornings are the most important time. Um, nine to 12, eight to 12, that's when I need to get the most important objectives done for the day. So those are usually blocked out, focused on hitting the results that I need for that day, whether it be recruiting, leading, managing, uh, fixing our systems. The afternoon is kind of left to fires or whatever else I need to do. When I was an agent full-time, and just so you know, I'm, I'm no longer in production because my agents are focused on that. In the afternoon, I went on my appointments. In the evenings, I was doing the contracts and all that. Um, as far as time today, it's it's definitely still 40 to 50 hours a week. Uh, obviously, I have other obligations now with family and everything. But when I was an individual agent by myself, um, I was easily 60 hours plus, whether that's good or, or not good. I, I was the guy that I was, was, was working a lot, working Saturday, Sundays. I didn't go to the football games or watch the Cowboys. I was out meeting clients and showing them houses. Well, let's talk about your team for just a second. Sure. When did you decide to start a team and how did you grow that team? Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, let me see how. I can. So 
in 09, I was an individual agent selling about 50 plus houses. Um, but I was going through a lot of personal stuff with my father who uh, had cancer that year. And the long story on that short, he passed away that year. And I had a reflection or epiphany in my life that year trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I was still single and I was working that 60 hours a week and realized I wasn't going to be able to build a life, a healthy life. 2012 happened. I saw this idea of expansion that was Gary Keller, the owner of our company, pitched. And I found my revived energy to start building a company that can expand not only across DFW, but across other cities in Texas. And who knows, maybe across the Texas border as well into other states. So my team today consists of three departments. It is my agents, of course, that are feet on the ground, meeting the clients, shaking hands, kissing babies. My operations teams that focus on everything behind the scenes, dotting the I's, crossing the T's. And then I have an inside sales team, which isn't too new to real, um, to the world, but kind of new to real estate. But all they focus on is making sure that lead generation and lead conversion is never dropped, right? And we have that going seven days a week. Very, very interesting. Very interesting. So how many team members do you have that are part of the Guam team? Six agents, five operations, two ISAs. And myself. Impressive. Congratulations. Thank you. And uh, I also want to give a shout out to your owners, Mike Brody, Dick Dillingham. I've known them for 30 years and uh, nice, fine, professional people. Oh, yeah. And, uh, so, Barrett, let's move over to you. How many hours a week do you work? Do you take time off for vacation? And then do you have a team? Yes or no? Why? Why not? <laughs> yeah. So I would say I was sitting here calculating it. I think I work 47 and a half hours every week. Y'all can fact check me on this. Um, so our hours, our whole team has the same hours. So we work Monday through Friday, nine to five 30. I work every other Saturday from 12 to five. And then every Sunday is off. You know, that's our team's day of rest, our Sabbath day, if you will. Um, and so our team is me plus four. So we got me, team lead, and then we've got three um, administrative assistants and then one showing assistant. And it's really come back to, again, like I was mentioning earlier, having clarity with the job roles. Um, and what I realized, so I hired my first assistant in the summer-ish spring of 2017. And what I realized, like I was saying earlier, is I, I was hitting this wall because I realized, man, like if I can spend more time generating new leads, right? Generating new business, the business will grow, but then I would quickly spend a ton of time dealing with transactional drama, right? Like deal, like actually handling those clients and those closings and those issues and those fires like didn't mentioned. And then I would like have to cut back on my lead generation time because I was spending so much transactional time. And then I would take care of those clients and then generate more business. And then I would have to spend time generating. So it was this huge porpoise effect, right? Um, and so I realized like, I need to hire someone. I need to like reproduce myself. Like I need to have someone else take care of at least some of this transactional stuff so that it can free me up to um, generate more new business. And so what I've realized is like, the best thing we can do for the business is create raving fans out of our current clients. Like if we can't give our current clients an incredible experience, like literally none of this matters, right? It, it will all fall apart. It's all kind of fake. And so uh, what we've done is just, we've kind of scaled it. Like for every three transactions we do a month, we hire one new um, team member to administratively help out. And so, okay, so you do the mathematics behind that in yeah. order to bring in another team member. That's right. That makes sense. And did you feel like when you brought in the new team member that it took away from your income? Because that's sort of a rumor that's out there that we know is not true. In fact, when you bring in a team member and you're literally sharing your money with them, can you express to our students what happens when you bring in a team member that you've been able to see mathematically even? Yeah, I mean, very simply put, I think 
when you bring it, well, actually, let me back up a little bit. I didn't really care about the money the first time I brought in a team member. I did it more to relieve stress, right? Like I did it more to relieve stress and give our clients a good experience. I knew that I would have to pay this person, obviously, but I didn't even think about the finances of it. Um, I just knew I needed help. Um, and so I would say, I mean, in an ideal world, um, and I would say this is true in practice as well, if you bring in the right team member to do the right job, they should, you should definitely get a return on your investment with that team member because, again, if you do it right, they will be giving your clients a better experience and it will free you up to do the things that, that you need to do, which in, in most of our cases is generating new business and focusing on loving on the people who are, who are connecting you with referrals. So if you were to claim a niche, so to speak, what would you describe your niche being? That's a great question. I would say my niche is my social network. Very simply put. I mean, the people, followers on Instagram, Facebook, definitely it's my SOI. And I would say the main way that I stay in front of those people is through um, those social networks. And now we have our students just thinking, I want to be like you. I want to be like Denton. And they really are because you both come across and are so professional, honest, and give such a great impression of our industry. And being that new person sitting in class, can you give them one, two activities right now to jumpstart even while they're sitting in class, is there something that you might share to help them get ready for when that license is in the mail? Uh, Denton, anything come to mind? Yeah, I'll give you two things, uh, a short-term one and a long-term one. So short-term, we kind of addressed it. Get your database together, go to your phone, go to your social networks and grab all that information and start going through and letting them know you have to tell them seven times before they think of you in real estate as a tandem, right? Seven times. Long-term where I see most people struggle is they don't have a long-term vision. Now you don't have to have a long-term vision like Walt Disney did when he drew up Disney world, but definitely have at least a five-year vision. Where do you want to be? Where do you want to see yourself five years from now? And Rita, what that does, it allows you to make the proper decisions today. So if you don't have a long-term vision, then any direction you run is going to feel like a good direction. But if you at least have a goal to go towards, you at least know that you're going to be moving down the right direction towards something, if that makes sense, whatever that vision is. And then you can just make course adjustments, right? It'd be like getting on a plane and going, where you want to go? I don't know. Well, I guess I'll just start flying in a circle. And we all know eventually you're going to run out of gas. I love it. Goals are absolutely primary when you are your own boss. Yes. And nobody's telling you what to do every day. Uh, no one except yourself. And I love the fact that you sit down and do a five-year plan or at least a three-year plan. And at the minimum, a one-year plan where do you want to be at the end of the year? How are you going to get there? And uh, Barrett, what can you add to that for our new people that are watching today? Yeah, I love everything Ditton said. Once again, shouldn't be a surprise at this point. I love it. Um, so I'm going to wish I had said like 10 additional things, but if I can only pick two, I would say have a system, have a system of keeping in touch with your people. I think phone is the best because it's free and nobody calls anybody these days and you will stand out if you call people. Um, and so also get good at asking for business, right? It doesn't have to be this awkward thing of, you know, sit down with a piece of paper and write down the two people who you know who want to buy or sell a house in the next one month. Like it doesn't have to be super aggressive like that. If that's your personality, awesome. But get good at planting seeds, like be a good pl a seed planter right? And I always just ask people, hey, you know what, if you know anyone 
who, um, if you think of anyone who wants to buy or sell a home in the next one month, would you please connect them to me? That would mean the absolute world to me, right? Like get really good at having those conversations. And if you have it enough, I promise you, you will see a return. So that was the first thing. The second thing I would say is, again, invite your social network into your real estate journey, but don't do it in a really lame way, right? Don't do it where you're just like taking a picture of a house and you say 123 Main Street for sale for $550,000, DM me if you're interested. No one wants to see that. It's lame and it doesn't let them get to know you any better. So don't post only about real estate and don't never post about real estate. I would say every three or four posts should be about real estate. Everything else, let people get to know you, but do it in a way, if you're brand new, right? You have no clients to show. Just go find a cool looking house on the MLS and just go preview it for a client and take a picture of the awesome pool with you in the background. You know, like, man, this crazy awesome pool in Westlake today. This is so cool. Who wants to swim with me tomorrow? You know, like, like you're planting those seeds mentally with people and they're thinking, oh, Barrett, I forgot he's in real estate. That's right. Oh yeah. He's actually out there looking at houses, huh? And just find interesting things to document throughout your journey. Because I mean, you guys know we have a really awesome job. Like we have really interesting jobs and people think they know what they're like, but they, they really don't. And they want to know what we're seeing every day. So I'm rambling now, but yeah. No, you're your not. That information is so valuable. Both of your informations that you just gave to our students, Denton and Barra, was so appreciated. And again, I encourage them to go to YouTube tomorrow and re review this interview today and write down all of these wonderful points that will give you a jump start. And unfortunately, we're towards the end of our interview, which I always just feel so sadly about because I could go on with both of you for quite a few hours. But uh, looking back at your 18 years in the business and what you've learned, Denton, would you change anything? Is there any advice you might have given to your younger self? Uh, or how do you feel about that? Yeah, I think there's a laundry list of stuff that I would do differently, but both positive, I'd learn from it. I think if I could sum it up, I would learn faster. Um, another way to say that is I would fail faster as well. I think half of my 18 year career, I was just looking to how to sell another house. The second half of my career, I was looking how to impact people on my team and how to build a business that will continue to go beyond myself, right? Two different mindsets. Um, so, you know, I got in business super young in my 20s. So I would say I would just continue to learn and never start learning uh, about the business and about myself, just fell faster. Fail faster, yeah. I've heard that yeah. before. Yeah. And that there's a lot of meaning to that because every sort of failure, disaster, you learn a whole lot from it. And it obviously makes us better, stronger in our personal life and our business. Yeah. And Barrett, what about yourself? Any advice you would give to your younger self, maybe something you might've changed these eight years later? Yes. On one hand, I wouldn't change a thing. I've loved it. Um, but in the spirit of the question that you're asking, I want to provide value to some people here. So I would say if I had to change something, I would say it would be, I would tell people, even if you're just beginning and you have zero clients, have a process, right? Like have a process. Imagine if a client called you, if a lead called you right now and said, you know, Rita, I want to buy a home. I heard, I saw on Facebook, you're a realtor. So can you help me? Um, or if someone says, Hey, Barrett, I saw your realtor. Can we go see one, two, three main street today? I saw it on Zillow. Like, what are you going to say? Right? Like what is the prop people, people want to be led. People want their agent to have a process, right? And so I think so often we just, we kind of wing it for the first couple of years. 
Um, and it le eventually you are going to have more clients than you can handle. And it's going to be almost too late to develop a process because you're going to be in it. So I would say have a process and ask yourself every single morning before you get started in the day, like, how can I add value to somebody today? Right? Like, wow. don't worry about the money. Don't worry about the commission. Don't mm -hmm. worry about that. If you add value to enough people, I swear to you, the business will take care of itself. So I started with that and I just wanted to end with that. Love it. So very, very valuable. What both of you have added this morning in this one hour, I know that we will have lots of people going back to YouTube to review this interview. And uh, I couldn't be prouder of both of you knowing your champions. I want to thank Linda Chase at our Plano campus for saying, oh, you need to interview Denton of Guam. He is awesome. And he is. Thank you, Linda, our manager in Plano. And then Christine Wright and Cindy Carter at our Austin campus. I think it was Christine who said, oh, Barrett Raven, he is exceptional. You need to most definitely interview him. They were so correct. And uh, next month, we're going to have uh, how to open your own brokerage. I have Michelle Busby out of Keller Williams in Austin. And then Fort Worth, we have Ashton Thies and Ashton Thies Realty opened her own brokerage. And uh, they will tell you how that came together. For some reason, it got a little dark here in my room. <laughs> I guess it means it's time to turn out the light and go home. But <laughs> Lights out, guys. Lights out. Lights out. Oh, they're on again. Okay. <laughs> Our two books from prior superstars. And most definitely in about a year, we want to have these two professionals Denton and Barrett in our books with their great words of wisdom. So thank you both again. And uh, most definitely Denton of Guam, Keller Williams, Plano, and most definitely Barrett Raven with Realty Austin. We are proud to call you our own. Thank you students for being here today. Thank you for your business, whether it's real estate, loan, appraisal, inspection, and um, certainly business etiquette as well. And a shout out to the president of our company, Kimberly Didelowitz, and glad that you are feeling well again. And Kurt Noblock with online, Debbie Blazes HR. They're both wonderful vice presidents of our company that help us look good along with our managers. But without our students, we don't have a business. And most definitely during the pandemic, being a virtual student, being an online student, you kept Champion School of Real Estate in business. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart. And as we always say, as I've always said, without your business, we don't have one. So thank you again, everybody. Have a great morning. And I so appreciate Denton and I so appreciate Barrett. Bye-bye.